Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are all very welcome indeed to the Four Courts, the historic centre of administration of justice in Ireland, and a very special and warm welcome to His Honour Judge Sean Enright and Mrs uh, Lorna Enright. We gather for a lecture to be delivered by uh, Judge Sean Enright, uh, who will speak on Easter Rising 1916, The Trials. This is uh, a public lecture, part of a series of lectures which is organised by our Court Centenary Commemoration Committee. The committee's aim is to commemorate centenary events which relate to the courts and to lawyers. The committee was established in 2013 when Ireland commenced its decade of commemorations. The committee's members come from the Judiciary, the Court Service, the Department of Justice, the Office of Public Works, the Bar Council, the Law Society and Trinity. And we are planning lectures and events at the Four Courts over the decade of commemoration. The committee is organising this series of lectures and is doing so in an inclusive way, reflecting the diversity of Ireland's history. We hope that our endeavours uh, will be of interest to those working in the law and those interested in Irish history. Apart from the lectures, we are organising other events, including a competition for schools in relation to media, art and drama competition relating to commemorative events. And we have organised uh, some successful walks around the legal quarter, looking at the buildings that are important in these events that we are commemorating. There will be further events in the coming months and years ahead, and the court service will keep you informed of them. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Judge Sean Enright. Judge Enright is a circuit judge of the Southeastern Circuit in England and a legal historian. He was called to the bar in Middle Temple in 1982 and in Dublin in 1993. He practiced at the bar in London for many years before being appointed to the circuit court in April 2008. He is the author of The Trials of Civilians by Military Courts, Ireland, 1921, which is an intriguing study of the imposition of martial law in the south and west of Ireland following the War of Independence. Judge Enright used his legal expertise and his passion for history to introduce an examination of the findings of almost 50 uh, cases which dealt, were dealt with under martial law. This evening's lecture is based on Judge Enright's latest book, Easter Rising 1916, The Trials. This book is an account of trials following the 1916 Rising. Judge Enright notes that between the 1st of May and the 31st of July 1916, over 3,226 men and women were arrested and filtered through Richmond Barracks in Dublin. 1,867 were deported and 171 prisoners were tried. The primary focus of his book and this lecture is the period from the general surrender on the 30th of April until the 17th of May. And during this time, 160 prisoners were tried by Field General Court Martial. Judge Enright explains that what actually happened in the trials is still emerging. Despite pressure in Parliament and in the press to disclose the trial records, what occurred in the trials in Dublin was consigned to the archives for decades. At the turn of the century, the Public Records Office released the trial records concerning the executed prisoners. It appeared that the rest of the trial records were destroyed as part of a routine cull. However, Judge Enright has described how his search through the archives in Dublin and in London has led to the extraordinary discovery of the trial records of 16 other prisoners. Through his extensive and original research, Judge Enright has provided us with a fascinating insight into the trials following the events of Easter week 1916. I look forward to hearing Judge Enright refer to the trial records of Ned, Ned Daly, who fought in the Four Courts area during Easter week. Lord Asquith asserted that the prisoners had been tried by due process, but there is an untold story. After decades buried in the archives, Judge Enright has found documents and brought information out into the light. The question raised is, to what extent can the rule of law be abrogated to protect the state from those bent on its destruction by force of arms? Judge Enright describes the focus of his work as, the emphasis of this story is more about trial process 
this crucial moment of history raises difficult questions about the operation of the rule of law in times of crisis. Tonight, we hear what his historic research has unfolded, and I ask you to welcome Judge Sean Ryan Wright, who will speak to us on Easter Rising 1916, The Trials. Chief Justice, distinguished guests, uh, it's nice to see you all here on such a wet and windy evening. I'm going to start, if you like, with the context. The rebellion crushed in six days. The trials, 160 in less than three weeks. 90 death sentences imposed, 15 were carried out. The trial records of the executed men went to the public record office in Kew. And I spent many months there looking at the records, occasionally surfacing to talk to my family and my wife and so on. The rest of the trial records were destroyed. I did what any lawyer would do when presented with four and a half feet of material. I scheduled it to see what patterns might emerge. And there were some intriguing and unpalatable patterns. And I have a question for you, which some of you will be thinking about in the course of this lecture and a question I'm asked about from time to time in England. I will answer that question in due course, do you follow me? But invite your forbearance while we look at some of the documents. So, the patterns, as any trial lawyer knows, every bundle of documents will throw up unusual patterns and give you a clue as to where the truth of the matter lies. And the first is the certificate of execution of Pierce, McDonough and Clark. David. The following men were carried out by 4.15 a.m. this morning as ordered. P.H. Pierce, Thomas McDonough, Thomas J. Clark, W.W. Rhodes, Major. And this was the execution of the leaders, all executed within a few minutes of each other, the officer supervising Major Rhodes. But the pattern, if you like, thrown up by the documents was this. His signature did not appear on subsequent execution certificates. I invite your attention to the second set of executions conducted the following day. Woolley Pierce, who was at the GPO, O'Hanrahan at the biscuit factory, and uh, Ned Daly, um, who had a command post here at the forecourt and was executed for that, and Plunkett, one of the signatories of the proclamation. I invite your attention to the signature in the bottom right-hand corner and you will see a new officer has been designated to supervise his executions, Major Heathcote, Charles Harold Heathcote. The next execution, John McBride, you see his name on the left-hand side, the date, the 5th of May, at the bottom, and the signature of Heathcote on the bottom right. I hope you can all see that from where you're sitting. The next set of executions, Colbert from Maribyrn Lane, Kent, misspelt in fact, he was at the South Dublin Union, Mallon at Stevens Green, Houston from the Mendicity. And you will see the officer records a certificate of death enclosed from the medical officer, do you all see that? And the certificate of burial. And I invite your attention once again to the bottom right-hand corner where you see Harold Heathcote's signature once again. The last two executions, Connolly, McDermott, also signed by Major Heathcote, there it is, and here he is. And I wondered about this officer because why bring in a new officer if all had gone smoothly? And why did he bring in new procedures as he did for the executions? Those are my thought processes. The answer I thought lay with Major Rhodes, but there were so few leads, in fact, pretty much none at all. And you will appreciate that the service records of officers from the Great War have long since been destroyed in general, or lost. And I spent, it was a long shot, some time looking for his service record. Here he is, just about to go off to the Boer War as a much younger officer, a rather sensitive young man on the face of it. And back to that certificate, which, the certificate of execution which puzzled me. I was able to find his personnel record and found a letter which he wrote from Vermont in America in February of 1917, which was in itself a remarkable document because 
there was a fantastic shortage of uh, army officers at the time. Britain was fighting for its life. And the question was, how did he get out of the army, and why was he in America during the Great War? Here's the letter, quibbling over his severance pay. Do you follow? There was 40 pounds overpaid. He's in Vermont now, and you see that very distinctive signature at the bottom of the page. And you'll see in the second line of the letter, he makes reference to a medical board. In other words, he appeared before a medical board and was invalided out of the service. For what reason? More searching around, and I found the deliberations of the medical board, and here they are. David will now read that to you. The board, having assembled pursuant to order and having read the instructions on the back of the form, proceed to examine the above-named officer and find that his vision left eye practically blind and less than six over 56 in right eye with glasses. So, excellent choice to run a firing squad, you may think. A very marked deterioration in the space of five months. We can all recognize a hooky document when we see one. I invite my colleague to read the next section. Temperamentally, he is not fit for a post necessitating much nervous strain. Well, there it is. Would you put such an officer in charge of a firing squad? Answer, no. Inference, his mental health difficulties arose after his last onerous duty, the execution of Pierce, McDonough and Clark. Uh, I can't think of another sensible inference, if you see what I mean. But certainly, if you look towards the bottom of the page, how categorically the board have signed him off for service. He was unfit for every form of duty. Active duty, general service, home duty, permanently. A remarkable deterioration. But there it is. And that intrigued me, as I'm sure you'll understand. But in order to take the inquiry further, and there were very few leads, I had to look at the wider picture, the executions of young men on the Western Front. And here we are. The army, the British Army, executed 304 of their own men in the course of the Great War. And in the course of a single morning, additionally, 47 sepoy soldiers after the uh, Singapore mutiny. 11 German spies, sundry uh, rapists, murderers, insurgents from different parts of the empire. And so naturally there was a system in a bureaucracy such as the army. And the system, without wearying you with the details, 12 men with Lee Enfields, a sergeant, a junior officer, and a provost marshal. But there were problems, not at every uh, execution, but you'll appreciate Soldiers were able to shoot at the enemy, coming towards them armed. It was sometimes a different picture when it was a man who was blindfolded and tied up. And many of these young men called upon for firing squad duty were church-going country boys. In their minds, it made them murderers, nothing less. They were sometimes rebellious, mutinous, and fired wide or did not fire at all. And there were various safeguards built into the system, and I'm not going to go through them all. The single rifle with a blank was one of those methods of inducing young men to take part in firing squad duty, the hope they would be the one to fire the blank. There were others, leave after the execution, a tot of rum, and so on. But the safeguards it built up included the attendance of the provost marshal to write the certificate of execution and you've seen those already. Also the presence of an army doctor to pin a white card to the prisoner's heart and afterwards to certify that death had taken place and that it had been instantaneous, do you follow me? Which was a standard upon which the army insisted. And I'll show you one now from the Western Front. Hasn't copied very well, but you will see the doctor has written halfway down, died instantaneously standard form of words, where the prisoner did not die instantaneously, that fact also was recorded, because this was the system in place. So that's from 1915, a private on the Western Front, and it's introduced as a comparator, if you see what I mean. We turn now to the certificate of death for Pierce, McDonough and Clark. This is to certify that I was present at the execution of the prisoners enumerated below, which took place at Kilmainham Jail 
on the morning of the 3rd of May, and that the prisoners were dead before the Commandant disposed of the bodies. P. H. Pierce, Thomas McDonough, Thomas Clark, H. V. Stanley, Captain. Eaton, this certificate, you'll form your own view about this, is unique in my experience because the words are, they disguise the truth very plainly. It's also a composite certificate. So far as death certificates are concerned, it was one certificate per prisoner, and the certificate always remained on the prisoner's file. That's the way it operated. Dr. Stanley was the officer who signed the certificate, and he was a man who cared very much for the prisoners in his custody. I suspect he was placed under a good deal of pressure to write an anodyne account of what had taken place. And this was his message in a bottle, which tells as much as he felt able to tell in the circumstances. There's more to all of this. There were straws in the wind which made me think that it was the third prisoner who had suffered most. Tom Clark, age 59. And about a year ago, a diary surfaced of a officer, a soldier in the Foresters, and here he is. I, he wrote a diary of what took place, and may I say that I'm always suspicious of diaries that come to the surface many years after the event, particularly after the Hitler diaries. But I can say this, his service record, which I've examined, shows that he was in the Foresters. The records show the Foresters carried out the executions. I've seen his entry in the London Gazette, which shows he was decorated with the Distinguished Conduct Medal for service in Dublin at the barricades and other good work, as the citation puts it. I can also say that he was killed in action in February of 1917, and therefore it is very likely that his diary entry is a contemporaneous account of what did take place. And there it is. The first rebel, McDonoghue, was marched in blindfolded and the firing party placed 10 paces distant. Death was instantaneous. The second, P. H. Pierce, whistled as he came out of his cell after taking a sad farewell of his wife. The same applied to him. The third, J. H. Clark, an old man, was not quite so fortunate, requiring a bullet from the officer to complete the ghastly business. Well, there are a few spelling mistakes there, and he's mixed up Pierce and McDonough. McDonough was married, uh, Pierce was not, and there is other evidence that McDonough came down to the yard whistling as he went. Remarkable, but there it is. And so that deals with the, the first set of executions. I said there were other patterns in the documents, and this is it. The death certificates for the other 12 executed prisoners are missing. And that speaks volumes because, as I put it here, is it significant? Yes, it is, because it flies in the face of the system that was in place. Uh, to lose one certificate is unfortunate. To lose all 12 smacks of system. Uh, why are they missing? They're missing because a number of the other executions were also botched. Um, let's see. Yes, this document shows, it's from Major General Sandback, he was the admin general in Dublin, and he's writing to London saying, I'm enclosing the court martial records. And you will see towards the very bottom, the part which is copied least well. He has enclosed the certificates of death by the medical officer. Do you see that in the last line? Yes. Uh, the the phot photography was mine, unfortunately. So there it is. You will appreciate my contention about the certificates remaining with the record of the prisoners is borne out by this document. But the question is, where do they go next? Anyway, the other executions. We'll never know for sure how many of the executions were botched. But here is a diary of a prisoner, a common band prisoner, held in the cells just above the stonebreaker's yard. And this is what she had to say about the 8th of May. Loud reports of shots at daybreak. We say prayers for whoever it was. Heard terrible moans, then a small shot, then silence. And Connolly strapped to a chair for his execution because he couldn't stand, although the evidence of this is rather more complex. There was a, a very long memoir from his daughter, Nora, who recorded that three and a half hours before his death, he was lucid and composed. 
and managed to smuggle from under the bed sheets a copy of the speech he made at his court martial. And she had the speech to prove it, if you see what I mean. I therefore judged her account to be fairly reliable. Well, the provost marshal, who saw him three and a half hours later at Kilnainen, said that he was deeply unconscious. And I wondered how it was ever possible, if at all, to reconcile these two accounts. The answer lies in the chronology, because we know Connolly had an operation to mend complex fractures on his leg on the 8th of May. He was tried in his hospital bed on the 9th of May and removed for execution on the night of the 11th. And they had to move him from uh, Dublin Castle at the hospital to Kilmainham, about a mile, I think, or maybe more. My geography of Dublin is not terrific. But you'll all see the cobbles in the castle yard, which were all over Dublin in those days. And they had to move him in one of those old bone shaker ambulances with solid rubber tires. How painful would that journey have been for a man in his condition? The inference I draw, for a number of reasons, not least that the medical staff had taken rather a shine to Connolly, particularly his doctor, and they gave him morphine to withstand the journey. And if you're going to give someone morphine on their way to execution, you give them a small dose or a large dose. That is what I think happened. Um, and I think it's a, a reasonable account of what took place. He arrived at Kilmainham. They were sitting there, slightly like nonplussed, because he couldn't stand. He was unconscious. They had a chair waiting for him. They had to shovel him into the chair the best they could. Legs sprawled forward, head thrown back, staring at the sky above. They tied him to the chair, not because he could not stand, but because he could not sit. And that's what happened to Connolly. Just a hint of what took place emerged in public a few days later. Not the whole story, by any means. Just the flavor of it, and caused the most intense embarrassment at Westminster. Uh, with the Mandarin scrambling for cover. We did not know about his wounds, they wrote. Patently untrue, in fact. But it was this capacity for embarrassment which was behind a lot of what was taking place in 1916 in the aftermath of the executions. The Prime Minister's promise was to publish the trial records. The generals at Horse Guards Parade opposed it for a variety of reasons, one of which they stated quite candidly, the paucity of evidence in some cases. And there were some very unattractive parts of the court-martial records such as the trial of Kent, where the record reads, the prisoner applies to call Thomas McDonough, who is not available, having been shot this morning. The Judge Advocate General also wrote a very convoluted note, which came down to this. These trials were not lawful. And so you see the potential here for major embarrassment to this Liberal Prime Minister and his government, and these were the political imperatives at work. The war in France, tens of thousands of Irishmen at the front waiting to take part in the Somme offensive, and Ireland was still the great recruiting ground. Nothing could be done or said which brought into question the loyalty of these men. So, my conclusions are set out here. I put it neutrally. The executions did not go well, although the records of the 59th Division record all the men died bravely. Rhodes suffered a breakdown, discharged from the army, went to America to join his wife. The trial of missing death certificates removed from the trial records. And I suggest here, given Asquith's promise to publish the trial records, those trial records could not be made to disappear, do you follow me? But someone put their hand into the file and took those certificates out for the reasons I have stated all done to prevent damage to the war effort, and so on. Back to that question then, and it's a question we all have to grapple with because the centenary is coming up. My rationale, twofold. Next spring, you will be remembering these events. We are a democracy wedded to the rule of law, and that's as it should be. But we are a nation founded on violence, and that must be remembered, because nearly every nation is founded on violence. Most of them had to fight for their freedom. Quite a few of them had to fight Britain. So there you are. But there's a more important uh, issue here about understanding history. 
there has been a sustained effort to cover up all that took place. I hate that old cliche, the cover up, but what other phrase can you use? The death certificate for Pierce, McDonough and Clark was written in a way which disguised what took place. The 12 death certificates of the other prisoners had been made to disappear. The 145 trial records of the men not executed have also been destroyed and no longer prepared to say that was a routine cull of unimportant documents. And the records of the executed men consigned to the archives for 100 years not to be opened in any circumstances. And it's uh, legitimate and proper for us here today to ask questions as to what did go on and how far did this cover-up extend. It is a most miserable affair. Turning then to the rebellion and the trials, General Sir John Maxwell was a key figure. He was the man sent uh, to Dublin on the Thursday after the rising began. And it's relevant to point out the army had certain powers under the defense of the Realm Act. In particular, the power to try civilians in the event of invasion or military emergency. It was essentially an early experiment in special powers, triggered by proclamation by the government. It was not martial law. What was envisaged was entirely lawful. It was an example of the military being called to the aid of the civil authorities and being accountable to the civil authorities. There was, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, a, a fly in the ointment. Wimborne, the viceroy, declared martial law in Dublin on Easter Monday, and Asquith, in cabinet on the Thursday, extended martial law nationwide, even with Maxwell was crossing to Dublin by destroyer. It was a colossal failure of nerve, essentially, in which all power and responsibility was handed to the military. Maxwell arrived in the early hours of Friday, and the surrender was already a realistic possibility. The men began to surrender on the Saturday. The background being this, that there were hundreds of prisoners already in custody. Every drunk, every vagrant, uh, every man like Sheehy Skeffington who couldn't account for himself, uh, every volunteer captured in the course of that week was now in custody with over 200 looters. Every cell in Dublin was full. And at this point, the insurgents began to surrender. And in the course of the Saturday and Sunday, 1,200 surrendered. The method of surrender was decent and honorable because they went in groups in uniform, carrying their arms to the point of surrender and laying down their arms, gave their rank and their name to those taking the surrender. It was, as I say, decent and honorable, but it exposed many junior volunteer officers to execution in due course. So here we have it, the greatest movement of civilian prisoners since the Boer War. Not just in Dublin, but coming up from every part of Ireland. The Kent brothers crossing Fermoy Bridge. Taken up this road, left turn under the clock tower into Richmond Barracks. That was the plan. It wasn't a, a subtle plan, but every prisoner taken would be moved to this barracks, and there would be a sift to determine who would be tried, deported, or released. The sift I would describe as utterly chaotic. The overcrowding was intense. The prisoners were crowded like you are now, you understand me, living and sleeping in those conditions, with very little water, no toilet facilities, and stale air. They were been sifted in the gymnasium at a rate of knots. The leaders were plucked out, the officers too, although it was quite capricious because many junior officers uh, were not picked out for no obvious reason. Michael Collins was picked out and told to go across to the other side of the room. He walked over and then he walked back, and that was the end of that. But they managed to pick out some teenagers for trial, uh, one as young as 16, and quite a few who were privates, essentially, who had been foot soldiers of the rebellion. Uh, in this uh, chaotic and capricious uh, 
enterprise, these prisoners were chosen for trial. That's how many were deported. They were shipped out in short order onto and into the hold of cattle boats and across the Irish Sea to various parts of England and Scotland. There was, in fact, no legal power to hold them. And some weeks later, letters of detention had to be signed by the Home Secretary to rectify the position. General Maxwell's view was, well, we can bring them back for trial if we need to, but any lawyer in the room will recognize the logistics of that exercise. In fact, only two or three were ever brought back, although the officers from, the police officers from Dublin were sent over many times to comb the ranks of prisoners, looking for those they might yet be able to recognize and to pin a murder charge on or something of that kind. There was, at this point, a crisis of evidence, and this is where the military's view of things collided with the law, because execution was only permitted under the Defence of the Realm Act, where there was an intention proved to assist Germany, and there was a paucity of evidence on this issue. There was an armed ship, but it was at the bottom of the sea. There were 23 German sailors in, safely in custody, and they weren't saying very much. The deadlock was broken by Pierce in a letter home to his mother. This is the mother and father of all letters home, if you see what I mean. My colleague will, will read it into the record. Dearest mother, you will, I know, have been longing to hear from me. I don't know how much you have heard since the last note I sent you from the GPO. On Friday evening, the post office was set on fire and we had to abandon it. We dashed into Moore Street and remained in the houses on Moore Street until Saturday afternoon. We then found that we were surrounded by troops and that we had practically no food. P.S. I understand the German expedition on which I was counting actually set sail, but was defeated by the British. Pierce, of course, was a lawyer by training, a barrister, although he barely practiced, I think, and he would have understood only too well what the consequences were of assisting the enemy in wartime. And I've often wondered whether this letter was driven by a desire to confide in someone, or be, because he sensed that there was a difficulty about the trials. Perhaps someone had intimated as much to him. He handed this letter like that, face up, with a postscript at the top, to an officer from the provost department. And within hours, a charge was framed, not just against him, but against every prisoner based entirely on this letter. That's the charge. Rebellion with the intention and for the purpose of assisting the enemy. And the method of court-martial, general court-martial, was the usual method of trying capital crimes. It carried protections for an accused prisoner, notably legal representation and time to prepare your defence. But if not practicable, field general court-martial could be ordered. And I use a rather crude analogy here between a Rolls-Royce and a Model T Ford, but it seems to me a fair analogy in the circumstances. The field general court-martial had certain protections for the accused, not many, but they were dispensed with by Maxwell, and no record was left as to why. Uh, the net result was a Model T Ford without brakes or headlights. So, the response by the prisoners, some oddly enough thought they might yet get their jobs back with the council. Others thought they might get a short period of internment. The leaders knew only too well what awaited them, and Pierce made a speech asking that his followers be spared. Tom Clark, an intelligent man, said the German allegation can be defended without dishonor. Eamon Kent said to his men, make what defense you can, because I will defend myself. And De Valera said, just say, just say you thought it were out for maneuvers, which was a defense taken up by very many prisoners. So preparations for trial began, and the first job was to find officers who could prosecute, officers who had legal experience. One was William Wiley, who was later Mr. Justice Wiley of this jurisdiction. Finding officers to try the case was rather more difficult because there were none with legal qualifications in the country, essentially. And an urgent request was sent to Westminster to find 
officers with legal experience. Well, this is the first guy who was already in Dublin. He's in the front row with a moustache and a walking stick. Looks like one of Rowan Atkinson's creations, if you see what I mean. But he was a most formidable man. Having served his career in Africa, defending the empire, and having run a concentration camp for at least three years. Not a man to trifle with, and he was a sort of officer that senior, men, senior officers turned to to carry out difficult, unpalatable tasks. Colonel Sutt was the man sent over by Horse Guard Parade. He is third on the left, seated with pith helmet and monocle. And if he seems like a caricature of a colonial soldier, that's because he was. He spent his entire career in India. There wasn't a legal brain in his body. At the end of the war, he married the widow of a private soldier. And just after the ceremony, the soldier turned up alive and well. And Colonel Sapp departed for foreign parts without even collecting his war medals. Uh, W.T. Cosgrave said this officer, his experience his understanding of the trial process was most elementary, was the way it was put. Uh, the trials, as I've said, the trial records are sent for destruction, say for the executed men, but they've been turning up here and there, one at the Public Record Office in Kew, two at the National Library of Ireland, and a whole batch at the Irish Military Archives, um, confusingly um, filed under a document not contemporary documents. So that they have been well cared for by the Irish military archives, and there is now a sufficient trial records, perhaps as many as 40, to carry out a more thorough analysis of what had taken place in those uh, um, days in 1916. The trials all took place at Richmond Barracks. There was Blackadder's Court in one room and just down the corridor, Sapp's court. They weren't really courts at all, they were small officers. And the witnesses and the prisoners had to sidle in and out. Here's a line of prisoners waiting to be tried. The man in the hat with his hand in his pocket is Major John McBride. Uh, you will know about him better than I, I suspect, because he fought for the Irish Brigade against the British in the Boer War and famously had his horse shot from under him at uh, the Battle of Colenso. Got back to Ireland eventually, uh, had a bit of a tough time of it, and then happened to be in St. Stephen's Green on Easter Monday when the volunteers were moving out, and he asked for a, commission, a position, position of command and was granted it. And so here he is, uh, waiting to be tried. He made no defence whatsoever. In fact, the record shows that he was caught in execution. He said, I did my duty, essentially. He called his landlady to give evidence, although she gave no relevant evidence in the case. I think he just wanted to see her. This is the only way it could be arranged. So there he is, waiting with the other prisoners to be tried. Eamon Kent is next in the queue behind him. McBride gave evidence for Kent, which can't have endeared him to uh, General Maxwell. Moving on, the key points the method of trial, field general court martial, 160 trials, in camera. The mischief of the in camera order is this the trials took place with such secrecy and at such speed, it was not possible for anyone to test the legality of what had taken place. It was all over in a few days. The prisoners had no access to the rules of procedure and there were no defence lawyers permitted to enter the barracks, save one who was able to give advice to one or two prisoners for reasons which are not clear. But in general, no prisoner had a defence lawyer. The prisoners were not allowed to give evidence. That was a good thing, in fact, because very few of them had a positive case to advance or a case that would withstand cross-examination, if you see what I mean. So silence was the best policy. The duration of the trials, five or ten minutes, sometimes a little longer, but that's it, essentially. And I've got the trial record of Con Colbert here, which my colleague will read out to you. Major J.C. Armstrong, Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers states, on 30th of April 1916, I was present at Bride Street and Patrick's Park, where the military troops were fired upon. The accused 
was one of a party which surrendered at about 5 p.m. He was dressed in a volunteer captain's uniform and he was armed. These officers were armed with pistols or revolvers. The men who surrendered came from the direction in from which the firing had taken place. The accused states in his defence, I have nothing to say. And that's it? That's how long the trial lasted? It is disturbing, is it not? You will see at the top of the page he's given his name in Irish, which probably did not endear him to his captors. Uh, there is also a detail which, and it's this, when the surrender was taking place at Jacobs, a number of the defenders of the garrison weren't aware of the plan for surrender and therefore shot at the advancing troops, which contained the provost who recorded that fact in their evidence. Uh, and you'll see it's been underlined by Maxwell there, which plainly had a bearing on Maxwell's deliberations. In fact, Colbert had not come from Jacobs. It was an error. He'd come from Maribone Lane, although it's right to say he'd been shooting at British troops all week. But there you are. That is the entirety of his record. It is essentially on a par with most. The prosecution evidence came from officers who took the surrender. And I said earlier the circumstances of surrender were decent and honourable, but it did expose people to execution by giving their name and their rank. The other main source of evidence came from captives held by rebels. Tom Clark, for instance, all the evidence against him came from people or soldiers in custody who had seen him at the GPO acting in a position of responsibility. Uh, though it's surprising how many of the uh, captives declined to have anything to do with the trial process. So as to the defences advanced by the leaders, Connolly and Pierce made no defence, they made speeches for posterity. A few took no part at all, including Clark, McDonough and Plunkett. Clark said nothing at all, not a word, neither McDonough. There were those who tested the evidence, O'Hanrahan and Markovitz, and by that I mean they probed the evidence but did not at any stage say, I did not do this, I am not guilty. Do you follow me? Which required a very great presence of mind because these trials were taking place within earshot of the firing squads. It was later said by William Wiley that Markovitz had begged for her life. The trial record does not bear that out, and I think that if a prisoner had begged for their life, Blackadder would have recorded that fact. There are other more complicated reasons why Wiley may have had a bit of a downer on Markovitz, but time does not permit an exploration of that issue. Suffice to say, I do not find his suggestion proved. There were those who denied assisting Germany, and there were remarkably few prisoners who actually cottoned on to the fact that the central cornerstone of the case against them was the intention to assist Germany. Cosgrave, Malin, and Daly, who was at the four courts. That was the case they had to meet. There were those who fought their cases on the fact, like Kent and Malin. Kent had a child, a son, I think, and Malin had uh, several young children, one of and his wife was pregnant. The foot soldiers. Sean Houston, who was in charge at the Mendicity, not quite a foot soldier, all he said, apart from denying the offence, he said, I've not had the opportunity to prepare defence. I've only had the charge a few hours. Desmond Fitzgerald was at the GPO, father of Garrett. He gave a long, discursive account, admitting everything, including things that could never be proved against him, and finishing up with the words, what I did, I did for my love of country. Fred Brooks at the Mendicity, he said I was a first dater. J.J. Waltz, later a TD at the GPO, he said I was in charge of sand and water. There were quite a few prisoners who said they had a non-combatant role, do you see what I mean? But uh, rather too many. Peter Doyle of the South Dublin Union, later Lord Mayor of Dublin for many years, I'm told, uh, he said, I was not armed, and indeed there was no evidence that he was. James Hughes was an NCO at Jacobs, and he said, and all that he said was, it has not been proved that I was armed. Gerard Crofts said, I've got a skin condition which prevents me holding a rifle. I was an auxiliary. 
William Partridge at St. Stephen's Green. He said I was forced to take part in the rising and uh, I just happened to be passing at the time and I was roped into the whole thing. The truth was rather more complex. His uh, senior officer, Connolly, had been executed some days earlier. Um, Markovitz, the next senior officer in the Citizen Army, narrowly escaped death. Uh, he was well in line for a death sentence because his task in the rising was to go down to the West Country, to Phoenix, to use his union connections to get the arms off the ship, onto the shore, onto the light rail link to Tralee, and off to Limerick and to uh, Cork. The arm ship was intercepted, and so he came back on Easter Sunday. He was suffering from Bright's disease at the time, which was a very debilitating condition. And so, crashing out at home on the Sunday night, he got up the next morning, got his uniform on, out the door, and staggered along the street, holding onto a lamppost here and there, or a shop doorway, and making his own way to St. Stephen's Green. He was an active trade unionist in Dublin at the time, and Jim Larkin is much remembered in the city. I just don't understand why this man was not, because his contribution to workers' rights was profound. James Burke was a sergeant at the South Dublin Union, and while awaiting trial, did the only thing he could, which was to remove the sergeant's stripes from his tunic. Uh, but he was found out, because you could see where the stripes had been, and the soldier who captured him uh, remembered him. The most frequently advanced defense is, I hold no rank. I thought I was just out for maneuvers. I was not armed. William O'Day, that's a, a boater he's got in his hand. Um, he was one of the Mendicity prisoners. And he said, I thought I was just out for maneuvers. He was disbelieved in that and sentenced to death. I found out from another source he was due to be married that weekend and did not show up at the church and formed the view he might have missed his wedding for rebellion but not for manoeuvres, do you follow me? Sentenced to death uh, uh, in the gravest peril, if not from General Maxwell, then from his fiancée, if you see what I mean. And uh, his sentence was commuted and off he went to the North Wall with the other prisoners where he met his fiancée waving from the crowd below and was able to pass down the ring. Corrigan, solicitor, would have walked in this hall where we are now, chasing counsel or finding a client and so on. He was uh, part of seven volunteers captured on the first day of the Rising. Uh, he was a section leader. He was the only one who was recommended to reprieve. And though they were all rec eventually reprieved, and imprisoned. I wondered why he got a recommendation to reprieve. I'm, William Wiley, who prosecuted, gave an answer to this. I'm not completely satisfied it's true, but he said at the end of this very short trial of 10 minutes, he jumped up just as Blackadder was writing the words, death by being shot, and said, I know this man. He's a solicitor. His firm briefed me before the rising, and the fee of five guineas is not yet paid. There's always a kernel of truth in what Wiley has to say. Perhaps he's embellished the record here, I do not know. But we all had trouble getting our fees in. The acquittals. John Reynolds, his defense was, I happened to be passing the GPO with my daughter. She went in to buy stamps. I followed her in, just as the rebels swept through the building. And we were held prisoner there all week. It was, of course, a load of old nonsense, but he happened not to be in uniform. He was not armed at point of surrender, and he was not well known to the G-men because he was an older prisoner and did not drill with the others. So there was no rebuttal evidence to be called. Kennedy, from the Maynooth contingent, I'm still researching him, he was acquitted, it's not clear why, and six of the seven Kerry prisoners were acquitted, which rather suggests an absence of evidence rather than a dispute about evidence. So, what do the trial records show? In general terms, I found a failure to comply with the rules. Most prisoners failed to realize that assisting Germany was the cornerstone of the case against them. And that, that fact was not proved against most of the prisoners. I hesitate to say they were innocent, if you see what I mean, but they were not guilty of the charge on which they were indicted. 
confirmation of conviction and death sentence, the usual process. The usual process was that the papers went to, because it was a, a soldier under the usual process, every officer in the chain of command had uh, their say about the fate of the prisoner. And the Judge Advocate General would give legal advice as to whether the conviction could stand or not. The process used by Maxwell, uh, it lasted less than a day. What material did he rely on? He relied on police reports, essentially, and he read the trial record, and that was it. There were one or two people, in fact, perhaps more than that, some people who wrote in to say, my nephew is in your custody, to invite him to spare him for this reason or that reason. But the process was as sharp and swift as that. The safeguards in the system, the Judge Advocate General, he had an independent power to review the trials and no conviction could stand without his consent. This was not a polite fiction, this was the law. Uh, the Judge Advocate General was Thomas Milvane, who was in fact dying in uh, the spring of 1916. He was much older than he is, appears in the photo here. And control had passed to the coming man at the office, Felix Cassell. A curious detail here, Cassell was a British infantry officer of German birth, born to German parents, it was said, and had been serving in the front line with the British Army until 1915, when he was suddenly brought back to the JAG's office, possibly with a view to taking over from Milvane in due course. It was also said he was brought back because he was rumoured to be the illegitimate son of Edward VII, and that was a good reason for getting him off the front line. Maxwell and his officers in this lineup, third from the left, you'll see the only officer on Maxwell's staff, Lieutenant Bucknell, been in the army nine months, always served under Maxwell, not an officer of the Judge Advocate General's office and did not enjoy the powers of the Judge Advocate's office. He saw himself pretty much as a member of the prosecution team. And so these were the dynamics at work in this unfolding legal tragedy. The second safeguard, the Viceroy, Wimborne, had the royal prerogative of mercy. Again, not a polite fiction, that was the law. It was for him to say yes or no. Swept aside by Maxwell, in fact, here is the Viceroy, um, famous for his port drinking capabilities, but probably one of the few people in the British administration in that week who discharged their duties to the full. And he tried very hard to re-establish the uh, ascendancy of the civil powers over the military uh, time and again without success. One of the men he failed to save and wanted to save was Con Colbert, who I've told you already came from the Maribone Lane garrison. He was third in command there. Second in command was Joe McGrath, who disappeared just before the surrender, anticipating what was going to take place. His first in command was Seamus Murphy, who was not picked out in the sift, but this boy was, aged 22. And he was executed because of the evidence that was obtained from him at the point of surrender, because he was in a uniform, a captain's uniform. He handed over his weapon, he gave his name. And that fatal error on the trial record I alluded to. His conduct at trial, giving his name in Irish, and not apologising or trying to minimise his role in any way. And I suspect some police intelligence about him. That's why he went before the firing squad. Why was De Valera spared? It was said in later years, mainly by his political opponents, that he relied upon his American citizenship as a way out. There is not a scrap of evidence to support that contention, and all the evidence is the other way. It was timing, pure and simple. When De Valera and his men surrendered, they were marching towards Richmond Barracks when an officer ran up and said, sorry, we're full and they turned them all around and took them off to the RDS. And De Valera and his men were not brought back to Richmond Barracks for three days, by which time there was a queue of prisoners being tried. And when his trial took place, 
his death sentence was confirmed. But at that crucial moment, Prime Minister Asquith said, no more. And men like De Valera and Thomas Ashe were the next on the list to be executed. That's the truth of the matter. Pierce, officer in the GPO, tried it crucially at an early stage and sadly uh, executed simply for that reason. So the executions, the sequence, 3rd of May, Pierce, Madonna, Clark, 4th of May, O'Hanran, Daly, Willie Pierce, Plunkett. The news dropped like a bomb in London. Maxwell was recalled to London, went back on a destroyer. Before going, he signed off the execution of McBride, who was executed a few hours later. 7th of May, Viceroy intervenes again to prevent further executions. He was ignored. 8th of May, Kent, Mallon, Colbert, Houston, all executed. The Viceroy clears his desk and resigns. 9th of May, Connolly tried in bed. McDermott tries to escape. He had polio, so he couldn't walk very far at all, no more than a few hundred yards. But he got himself out of his cell onto the square where a group of men were being moved out for deportation and stood there, staring straight ahead. Unfortunately for him, he was seen by an officer, taken out of the list, tried the next day. 11th of May, Connolly and McDermott are removed for execution. 12th of May, Prime Minister arrives in Dublin. Uh, there's now breakfast for the prisoners, jam, eggs, bacon, and some of the soldiers are begging food for the prisoners. There are no more executions. It's now a political issue. There he is, uh, trailing anxiously around Richmond Barracks. Although, oddly, when this picture was taken, even a few yards away, the prisoners in the country were still being tried in camera, without legal representation, being sentenced to very long terms of imprisonment. Uh, one wonders what was going through his, his very able mind. I do not know. The roundup's still taking place. Quite a good picture, this one, because these are not part of the surrender. You can see that because they have assembled a kit bag, a coat. Uh, some of them have pipes, scarves, and so on. And these men um, rounded up, and very often not yet rounded up. They simply went to the police station, knowing that that was going to be their lot, and it was best to avoid a tearful scene at home. As to the legality of the trials, there are issues relating to unfairness. I've mentioned access to the rules and the in-camera order, although I pause to observe, the in-camera order was challenged in a legal action by George Gavin Duffy, uh, unsuccessfully, perhaps not surprisingly, given that Britain was still in the grip of the Great War. But I've, I've already said the mischief of the in-camera order, never addressed by the, the High Court, was the inability to test what was being done and the legality of all that was done. As to unlawfulness, no free access to witnesses, no opportunity to prepare a defence, and some people had the defence to offer, no review by the Judge Advocate General, no review by the Lord Lieutenant. These trials were unlawful by the standards of the time. My observations on due process, every generation faces challenge, challenges, the underlying issues relate to due process, imprisonment, fair trial. There are always those who will argue that the challenge is so great we can comfortably abrogate the rule of law without causing lasting damage to society. We can all think of occasions where military courts have been convened in this country or that country to try journalists or insurgents. It's just a made-up jurisdiction, do you follow me? And we should be alert for it. We can all think of very high-profile cases in the recent past where people have been unlawfully moved in and out of jurisdictions. I'm not going to go into the detail of that. And looking back on each of those episodes, how much trouble they have caused, how much trouble they have caused. I'll give one example, the Widger Report, a failure to offer redress to the victims of Bloody Sunday, and we are still unraveling the mess. A due process is therefore our protection, all our protections, and we're all the poorer when it is set aside. 
That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>